This is Killer Innovations, a show about ideas, creativity, and how you can innovate. Welcome to the Innovator's Garage, where you learn to create your next game-changing killer innovation. So, how's your week going? We are back here in the studio. We've had a great week. Lots of things going on. Uh, as we shared in the last show, we're doing some experiments with some short-form content. So check out, if you haven't listened to uh, last week's show, to catch what we're now calling Five Minutes to New Ideas. It'll appear in the fourth segment. It's a little bit of an experiment. We'd like to hear your feedback, so please listen to the entire show to get into the fourth segment. Check out that five minutes, part of giving you some sparking ideas that hopefully will drive and lead you to coming up with some new products, some new services, some ways to transform your business. As uh, It's just one way we're trying to uh, just change things up. As I've said many times in the past, uh, you don't want to get yourself in a rut. You want to constantly innovate the way you innovate. And here at the show, we are constantly looking at ways that we can innovate the show to bring more value to you. So check it out. Give us some feedback. Let us know. This week's show is actually the result of a conversation that I had in a taxi cab in Austin, Texas. Most recently, a little while ago, I was in Austin for South by Southwest. I was giving uh, or hosting a meetup, as they call it, in South by Southwest around neurodiversity hiring. How do you think about as a leader, hiring those that are on the autism spectrum is just one example of neurodiversity. How do you think about hiring people uh, on the autism uh, spectrum to be employees within your organization? And where I'm CEO, we have a neurodiversity hiring program. And so South by Southwest was interested in having us share how we do that and the benefits we get from that, particularly around creativity and innovation. So I get done with the talk, go back to the hotel, grab my bags, hop in a cab going to the airport. Got this young man driver uh, from, I think it was Nigeria, if I recall correctly. And we got into a whole conversation, and I shared with him some of the work that uh, my family does in Rwanda with our investments and entrepreneurs there. And he was asking a little bit about my background. I shared where I was at now and kind of my history. And then this driver just shifted the whole tone into almost feeling like I was being interviewed on the drive. And he was taking mental notes. He was asking about, you know, things that, uh, you know, how did I get to be successful? How did it, uh, you know, what lessons could I share with him? You know, he was driving a taxi basically to put food on the table and keep a roof over the head of his uh, young family. Uh, but this was clearly somebody who had uh, uh, desires to do more than just be satisfied with what his current uh, career outlook looked like. So we got to talking and I was sharing some things with him and we got to the airport and I, we got stuck in traffic, but to be quite honest, I didn't care. The conversation was so engaging. Me learning from his perspectives of what it was like, where he came from and then being an immigrant and trying to find work and think about career, family. It just also reinforces that it doesn't matter where you are in the world. We all have kind of the same basic fundamental drivers, right? To, you know, growing up, getting married, having families, um, providing, uh, doing something that has impact, leaving a legacy, all those types of things. And so this driver specifically asked me about my kind of, you know, what, what were the things that I kind of followed as kind of my rules to live by that, uh, that I felt contributed to the success I had. And I didn't have anything planned. Now, some of you, if you've listened to the show for a long time, there was probably a show, I don't know, it's got to be four, five years ago where I talked a little bit about this. But to be quite honest, I really haven't thought about it recently. So I get on this plane, flying back from Austin to Colorado, and I actually sat down in my notebook and I started listing out kind of the, those things that are what I would call what are my personal rules to live by. 
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to share them with you. Now, some of these are innovation related. Some of them are totally not innovation related. And look, these are my rules. I'm not trying to project or push these on to anybody else. But I've shared them with a few people. People were keenly interested, asked if they were written up someplace. Is it in a blog post? Could they download it? So this is um, the form that I'm going to use to share what I think are kind of my personal rules, basically reverse engineering what kind of goes through my head. And I've documented down into my notebook on what I call the seven rules to live by. Now, these are rules that I apply both to my personal and my professional life. Uh, you know, for me, uh, I suffer from severe workaholic, right? I'm a recovering workaholic, um, and I still struggle with it where uh, if I'm not careful, I'll peg the needle onto the work side and in some cases actually sacrifice my personal side. So these are the seven rules. Now, we're going to go through it. I'm going to go through each one and talk a little bit about each one. Um, as we go forward. And as always, if you're in the car, don't worry. You do not need to take notes. These will be posted up on the show notes over at killerinnovations.com. And by the way, if you've got other ones or you got ones you don't agree with here, hop on over to Killer Innovations and put them down in the comments section of the show notes. We can have a conversation there. Okay. So, first one, uh, the first of the seven rules to live by is. Stay connected to the people who matter most. I learned this from Bob Davis, my early mentor. Bob was phenomenal at staying connected with people he'd worked with decades before. Um, and this was back, you know, in the uh, 80s and early 80s. So this is pre-internet, pre-broad availability to email. Bob took it upon himself to constantly stay in contact. He would basically put people on a list and he would, Bob, every six weeks, touch somebody on the top of that list. So he had probably like 15 or 20 people, and he would go out and, and touch them. And I learned this from him. Now, as we've progressed, we've got email, we've got Facebook. And look, I don't think those count. I make an effort to actually call somebody or get a time scheduled with them to call and actually have a conversation. And it's not about hey, do I want something from them or do I need them help on a project? It's just staying connected, hearing what's going on in their personal life, their professional life, how their kid's doing, you know, how's that new project that they're working on, just staying connected. And again, I don't constitute electronics as qualifying. Just sending whipping somebody off in an email or uh, sending them a, a Facebook message, message or something does not qualify. And this is one that's allowed me to stay connected to people, you know, for many, many years ago. Now I've adjusted the list. I've added people to the list. I've taken people off the list over the years of my career. But I can tell you, the people that have been on the list are the ones that have had so much influence in me being able to progress my career. Because we had that more in-depth personal relationship, they knew what my desires were, they knew where I was at, professionally they knew kind of where my head was thinking kind of thing I like to do and when new opportunities came up they actually approached me and if I look back over probably the last you know four or five major jobs I've had it wasn't ever me leaving and trying to go find the job it was people in this network that I'd stayed connected to that had come back and contacted me Number two kind of ties into that is, is listen more, talk less. When I reach out to these people or any conversation, people like to dominate talking. You know, look, we all like to talk about ourselves. But for you to be viewed really as somebody really interesting, it's really not about what you say, but it's about letting the other person talk and about listening and being active in the listening, asking questions about, uh, you know, follow-up questions to whatever they talked about. This is hard for me. Look, I'm standing in front of a microphone in my own uh, professional studio that I had built in Colorado. I, my job functions, whether when I was CTO at HP or now CEO at Cable Labs, is about me out talking. So this is one that I actually have to work hard at, and I need to get better at it. 
and that is listen more, talk less. And at the end of every conversation, here's a general rule. Ask the people that you're talking to how you can help them. I always try to end the conversation with, hey, thanks for the time. Is there anything that I can do to help you? And that, again, injects, kind of reaches across the hand and says, hey, is there something that I can help you with? And uh, that tends to wrap up the conversation. So stay connected to the people. Number one, listen more, talk less is rule number two for the seven rules to live by. Now, we've got five more to go through. We're going to continue on this conversation as we get past this next break. So don't go anywhere. And you're listening to Killer Innovations. Welcome back. We've covered two of the seven rules to live by. Let's pick up with number three. Number three is only make commitments you are truly committed to follow through on. Do not make false promises. Don't go out there and promise everything to everybody and then only do the ones that you are really, truly uh, committed to. And this is one that is just more frustrating than anything else I've come across where people have committed to do something they're going to they're going to make a call on your behalf or send you something and then nothing happens you know radio silence uh, so this is one that i try to live by and i look for the people that are in my close uh, network to always live by now the flip side is is i can look back on my career where i made commitments that i couldn't deliver on there, I've made some commitments to people to, with all good intention, and then things come up and I couldn't deliver. And what I actually found is, is by stepping up and admitting that said, hey, I told you I could do that. I've looked into it. I just can't deliver that. I'm sorry. I know I made the commitment. I apologize. Is there something else that I, could, that I, that I, can, that I can do to make this up? Because I know I promised this to you, but I'm not able to, to fulfill that commitment. Now, when I say only make commitments you are committed to follow through on, some people swing the pendulum so far the other way, which is they make no commitments. They always are using weasel words. Well, I'll try or I'll look into it or, or let me think about that. Uh, no, this is not, that's not the, the resolution to this. Make commitments, deliver, does not mean don't make any commitments, right? We all live by commitments. You commit to your, your spouse or significant others. If you've got kids, you make commitments to your kids to be at their ball games. In my case, my commitments nowadays mostly revolve around my grandkids. And, you know, Audrey, my oldest grandchild, she just turned six. She's in kindergarten and being at her winter program at her school, right? Make commitments, deliver, do not disappoint. The other one, number four here is don't get hung up on credit. Early in my career, you know, so keep in mind the late 70s and through the 80s, there was this big battle within a lot of larger corporations around, you know, who got the credit for the idea. And again, I'll go back to Bob Davis. He was my mentor. He was the one who hired me when I would call into my true first job. Um, from college, uh, and it was a company called Deltac in Naperville, Illinois. It was part of Prentice Hall Publishing, and Bob was a phenomenal mentor. I talk about him a lot in the radio show, and he's actually listed uh, pretty high up on the uh, dedication page in my book. My career wouldn't be where it is today without what Bob supported me on, and this is one of the things that he taught me was not getting hung up on the credit. Credit will always find its natural owner, the person who should eventually get it, because other people will recognize it. And also, by not being grabby on the credit, the other people who are on the project are going to be more willing to actually portray that credit to you, to, to shine the light on the work that you did if you're not grabby on credit. Now, this plays out especially important for innovation. Why? Because in innovation, it's all about ideas. And everyone wants to say, oh, I came up with that idea, right? 
I just when I joined the the company I'm at now with as a CEO, <clears throat> and I went to the first big conference, 800 people um, at this event up in Keystone, Colorado. And there's a key technology that the organization had invented a dozen years ago, long before I got here, right? And at this conference, so this would have been August of 2012, I had no less than two dozen people from inside the organization and outside the organization to introduce themselves to me and then claim to be the inventor, the one person who invented this technology. Two dozen people, no less, probably closer to 30 people came up, introduced themselves to me, and then to claim credit that they were the inventor for this technology. Now, look, it's very rarely that any innovation comes from one person. There's inspirations, there's teams. And to be quite honest, when I look back, all of these people were involved in the early days. But again, it was a situation where everybody was kind of raising their hand saying they were the inventor. When in reality, it was probably all of them working together. Innovation is a team sport, and a team sport can also include things, technologies, innovations that were inspirations long before you got involved even in the project, in this case, myself. So don't get hung up on the credit. There's more than enough credit to go around, and this tends to be one of the big stumbling blocks for innovation because it will actually kill any interest from other people to be participate and contribute. And again, innovation's a team sport. So number four, don't get hung up on credit. Number five, which kind of plays into this, acknowledge others. Give out words of encouragement. And this is important if you're a leader. If you're leading an innovation team or you're a manager or a director or a vice president, my, you know, my case when I'm a CTO or now that I'm a CEO, it is acknowledge others. You didn't get to the position you're in. I did not get to the position of being a CEO all by myself. There have been people who've had played a critical role in my success over the years, and it's on through their help I've been able to get to where I'm at today. At the same time, acknowledging that, giving the encouragement, giving the encouragement to other people who are early in their careers, mentoring, I find to be extremely, extremely satisfying. I go out of my way, for instance, and I have for years, even at HP, getting very involved with the interns. And in fact, you can go back and listen to some old shows, because when I, lived, when I was CTO at HP and I lived in Silicon Valley, I would actually select two interns every summer and they would live with me at my house and I called it reverse mentoring because I didn't have you know my kids were out of college they were you know newly married at that time so I was kind of missing out on what was going on in the customer segments of college kids so this was the best way for me to tap into that by doing this reverse mentoring and acknowledging them giving them words of encouragement and look some of my interns have gone off to have absolutely mind-blowing successful careers and it's all because of them not because of me they did great work and they've achieved great things uh, but stepping out and acknowledging others giving that words of encouragement encouraging others um, is one way one of the rules uh, that I live by or at least I try to live by and I try to do this I need to do this more and more I'm, I, I tend not to do as much now just because of being busy in my travel schedules and et cetera. So this is one that I'm actually writing myself a note here on a piece of paper that I need to step up on and get better about. So again, stay connected, listen more, only make commitments, don't get hung up on the credit, and acknowledge others. So we've got two more to go. We'll do that right after we get back from this break. Welcome back. We're talking about the seven rules to live by. These are my rules. I'm not trying to project them on you, but these are the rules that I try to live by. So number six, hug the haters. There is always going to be somebody out there that's going to be criticizing you or critical of what it is you're doing, or they just don't like you, right? We've all lived through it, whether it was in grade school, junior high, high school, whatever, and look, we have that in the workplace, particularly as you get to be more successful or you get to be higher profile. Uh, social media has 
have done a lot of really great things, but social media is also given a platform for the haters, for the trolls. So I say hug the haters. One is, is I kind of have this rule of what I call count to 10 before I respond. What I really mean is, is if someone, you know, criticizes me on Facebook or Twitter or a reporter criticizes something that I said in an interview, whatever, I don't immediately respond. And in fact, for reporters, I never respond. doesn't matter how harsh they are in the article they write, I'm not going to respond. Um, even in social media, et cetera, I will always typically wait for the day if I can, wait till the next morning, or count to 10, take a deep breath, get your perspective, and actually bring other people in to have them read it to see if you're reading it the same way. So I count to 10, and I, the other rule about this is always respond with compassion. Not harshness, not rudeness, not name-calling. Always respond with compassion. And as part of this, I have a kind of a sub-rule around this, which is never, ever burn the bridge. Someone may have just really just stabbed you in the back. I mean, I've had people rip me off for money, um, done all kinds of horrible things, and I've never, ever burned the bridge. You never know when you might need that bridge or you might be able to rebuild that relationship at some point. I never view somebody has done something so horrible to me that I could never rebuild uh, that relationship. So number six is hug the haters again. Count to 10 before you respond. Always respond with compassion and never, ever burn the bridge. You can always rebuild the relationship. Now, what's number seven? Seven, this is the seven rules to live by. What's number seven? Number seven is create your own approach to prioritization. You're going to get lots of demands and requests on your time. As I shared Earlier in the show, you know, I am a recovering workaholic. You know, I'll, I would do 80, 90 hour days. I could find myself constantly face down in my phone, um, you know, work, 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 and sacrifice my personal and my family um, in, in, in the process of that. So I have to set my own set of priorities that I use whenever I get a request for, you know, come to a speaking engagement, come teach a workshop, um, travel to some different location where it's going to take me two days to get there to coach or mentor a team. I have to have a set of priorities. You need to create your own set of priorities that says, where does this fit in to this? And it's a balancing act. You're never going to have it one way or the other. you got to have a balancing act. The prioritization process that I use, again, this is for me, but the prioritization process that I use is what I call the five F's. The five F's. The five F's are faith, family, friends, fitness, and finances. Let me go through that again. Faith, family, friends, fitness, and finances. Now, what do I mean by all this? Faith. My faith is, is, is incredibly important to me, but it's also very personal to me, right? But if I'm, if something, if I get weird, if I get this weird request that somehow it doesn't match with, you know, a, a faith system for me, then I don't get involved in it. You know, there's certain things like, you know, I don't drink, I don't gamble, but that's, what, that's a personal choice for me. I'm not saying it's bad for everybody else. That's a personal choice for me. But I believe that, if you, you know, that faith is important, whatever, whatever religion or faith model, faith system you believe in. Um, the great thing about our country is, is you can practice whatever it is you believe in. But for me, faith is important. It's, and it's number one. Number two is family, my wife, my kids, my grandkids, right? Number three are my friends. That kind of ties back to rule number one, which is staying connected to the people who matter most. And those are my friends, right? So they're number three on my priority, li priority list. What is it I can do to engage, help, support, communicate um, with those friends? Number four is fitness, right? Look, 
life is not a sprint. Life is a marathon, right? And you don't want to like just burn out and suffer all kinds of health issues um, just by working yourself to death and not eating right, et cetera. Now, I will also be the first to admit I'm not very good at this, right? My wife is incredibly good at this. She's, you know, watches her diet, she exercises, uh, and her endurance to chase the grandkids around is far more than mine. And again, this is an area that I've got to work on, but it is uh, an important one, so fitness. And then last is finances. Now, I put finances at the end of the 5S for a very specific reason. Because early in my career, when I was really, you know, off the scale on my workaholic uh, issue, um, I put finance at the front and I was able to rationalize, well, finances are important because that allows me to, to take care of my, my family, to, you know, donate to the charities that I want to be part of, to help friends who may run into financial troubles and uh, I can help them out a little bit. Right. And it allows me to, you know, quote, you know, do the fitness thing because I can afford to belong to a country club or whatever. Right. We, we it's easy to rationalize by by looking at dollars as the means to do everything else. And what I have found is, is by putting finances at the bottom, it takes care of itself. It's not something that I have fortunately you know, the last couple of decades of my career have had to think about, right? If I keep my priorities, if the work that I'm doing day in and day out is, of, you know, if I've got high integrity, I execute, I deliver to my commitments, um, I don't get hung up on all the credit, um, I, I acknowledge others, encouraging others, share the credit so that they feel um, part of it. Uh, the finances take care of themselves. So my personal set of priorities, again, are faith, family, friends, fitness, and then finances. What I'm encouraging you to do is don't take my five S if they don't fit for you, but create a set of priorities. So therefore, you have some form of a filter against all the requests that you have against your time, your energy, your uh, emphasis, your investment of, of, of whatever, um, you need to have something, some, some filtering mechanism that you can apply to help you sort through so that you don't get um, uh, screwed up by having a wrong set of priorities. And I'll be the first to admit early in my career, um, I didn't have this and uh, I, you know, did not have a good set of priorities. And it took me a long time to kind of dig myself out of all the problems that caused for me and my family. So again, for me, it's faith, family, friends, fitness, and finances. So again, let's go through the seven rules to live by one more time. Number one, stay connected to the people who matter most. Number two, listen more, talk less. I need to do more of that. Number three, only make commitments you are committed to hold, follow through on. Four, don't get hung up on the credit. Five, acknowledge others, give words of encouragement. Number six, hug the haters. And number seven, in my case, setting, set your priorities. And for me, that's follow the five Fs. I hope you found this useful as we wrap up this segment. In the fourth segment, we are continuing our experiment. We are creating a five-minute uh, essay, commentary, whatever you want to call it, where I share with you what I call five minutes to new ideas. This is a five minutes of sparking conversation to spark ideas for you to come up with new products and services in whatever organization, business, whatever you do. So think of it as a five minute brainstorm. So stay tuned. We're going to do that right after this quick commercial break. As we continue our experiment at light, finding ways to deliver more value to your listeners, here is this week's five minutes to new ideas. I've always been interested in graffiti. 
and I make a point to go out and photograph it whenever I'm traveling. It's an elaborate and sometimes quite visually stunning way of saying, I was here. This is who I was, and this is what I was thinking at the time. I remember visiting a small, obscure French castle on one of my trips, well off the tourist route. On the walls of the dungeon, someone had chiseled the outline of a hand and carved the words to the effect of, Pierre was here. It dated to the late 14th century. It's interesting that people have always felt the deep-seated need to announce their presence, no matter how fleeting our time is here on Earth. Now, fast forward to the early 1990s. I buy lots of completely random magazines when I'm traveling. Anything from Eastern European news rags to local magazines and newspapers. It's my way of constantly searching for new inspiration. Years ago, I picked up a copy of a magazine called Graphitosum in the old Tower Record store in Piccadilly Circus in London, now long gone. It's a magazine aimed at graffiti artists. The magazine showed pictures of graffiti art from all over the world, but also highlighted gallery ex exhibitions built around graffiti. What it considered by some as a crime was now being shown in galleries, being sold to early adopters, and eventually ending up on the walls of people's homes. Now this was all interesting, and it appealed to my visual bent as a former architecture student, but it didn't necessarily herald that a big change was happening. Not long after I became aware of a subtle shift was in the works. An early mobile application came out called Tag and Scan. Tag and Scan allowed you to leave your graffiti digitally. The app would let you type out a message such as an opinion of a local restaurant and digitally suspend it in front of the destination. Now anyone standing at or near that spot with that app would see the message you left. This was graffiti set to maximum. It used to be that if a restaurant was tagged with unflattering graffiti, the owner could just scrub it off or paint over the top of it. But with digital graffiti, you could now leave virtual message and the owner couldn't do anything about it. This transition from obscurity to the edge of mainstream was the first hint of something new. Transitions like this are hard to see, but when you do find them, jump on it. The tag and scan application was an early experiment and was limited to a small section of London, but I could feel that it was a program that was giving a hint to something much, much bigger. Today, we have seen an explosion of location-based services. They are the direct successor to Tag and Scan, and they tap into that same desire to be known, to be remembered, to have your opinion felt and heard, the same desire that causes people to chisel their name in a rock or tag a wall with an aerosol can. This action fed a human need to be known. Nothing is worse than being anonymous and unnoticed, and each of those examples evolved from the thing that came before it. This leap from physical to digital graffiti was a catalyst to all kinds of location-based services. And as I look back, I can now see the subtle hints that something was about to change. The holy grail of innovation is seeing what your customers are going to need and want in the future, even if they themselves don't know it yet. And to see it before anybody else you need to identify what I call the weak signals. These weak signals will give you the heads up that something radical and possibly uncomfortable is coming your way. They are the canary in the innovation coal mine. Of course, the trouble with weak signals is, is that they are exactly that, weak. They are easy to ignore. It's human nature to tell yourself, oh, nothing is going to happen with these trends. The world is just going to stay the same which is why I'm not telling you about my big launch and hugely successful product that is a direct descendant of Tag and Scan. Despite my fascination with the graffiti culture, I miss the ways in which I was here sentiment could be adapted to social technology. Now, the excuse I use is that this oversight was more to do with the slow pace of adoption rather than underestimating the importance of the graffiti mindset. 
Keep in mind that we are talking about a weak signal that took almost 15 years to go from fringe to broad adoption. It's easy to get distracted and fall into that trap of thinking that it will never make it. So how do you find these weak signals? You're not going to find them on the front page of the newspaper or in an industry analyst report. If you're pitching me an idea that you already seen and has been covered by an analyst report, forget it. You are too late. If you're pitching me a weak signal that you uncovered during a customer conversation or found in an obscure magazine or local paper you picked up on a layover on the other side of the world, then I'm interested. A weak signal is something that seeps into society almost unnoticed. One week you've never heard it, the next it's a fitness or shopping craze that all your friends have signed up for. The question you need to keep asking is, how can I take advantage of emerging trends and fads? To help you answer this question, ask yourself, what hints are you getting about changes in customer behavior, product innovations, or shifts in the marketplace? What non-standard input, such as inspiration, such as reading fringe magazines, do you use as a way to find weak signals? And number three, how do you share these emerging trends within your organization? By asking the right questions and keeping all your senses open, you can uncover those weak signals. I'm Phil McKinney, and thanks for listening. First off, I just want to say thanks for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us today. We'd love to have your feedback and comments both on this new segment and segment four, but also on the entire show. Hop on over, add your comments over at killerinnovations.com in the show notes, or better yet, join us over at the Innovators Community. That is the innovators.community. That's an online Slack area where you can become part of the conversation with other leading innovators from around the world. That includes uh, chief innovation officers from large corporations down to startups. It includes professors, academia, government officials, all those interested in how to take advantage of innovation to achieve their objectives. So hop on over and check that out. Also, if you've got any suggestions for guests, drop me a note at phil at KillerInnovations.com. With that, we're going to wrap up this week's show. Thanks for your time. Have a great week. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.